Lord have mercy. In the South, when things go mildly wrong, you will always hear somebody say, well, Lord have mercy. As in, you spilt the water all over the floor, child. Lord have mercy. Or, you gonna wear that to church? Lord have mercy. So we rarely use the phrase in any kind of serious way. We, we use it to note mild surprise and minor irritation. Then usually it's meant to be somewhat humorous. For years I didn't know it was a form of swearing. Now, I might surprise you to hear me say that it's a form of swearing, but Lord have mercy. I say Lord have mercy is a form of swearing because, uh, well, we're not used to hearing swearing like that because in English, swearing almost always involves body parts and toilets. <laughs> but there are languages like French, for example, where saying the words for body parts just doesn't bother anybody. You can say them all you want to. They don't know what you're upset about. But swearing in those languages usually draws more on blasphemy, which is the use of holy words inappropriately. So when we swear like the French, we don't feel much guilt about it. Uh, by the way, Kyrie eleison is interesting because it, that's the one phrase that's endured from early Greek, and even when the mass was in Latin, you would, you would hear the priest or the people go into the Greek phrase, Kyrie eleison, Christi eleison, Kyrie eleison. And in the early days in Germany, the people heard them saying this so much, Kyrie, Kyrie, they, were, they, they thought they were saying Kirche, Kirche, which came, became the word for church. English comes from German, so the word church actually comes from that phrase, which is interesting. So, But like many of our sayings in the South, Lord have mercy, has been passed down by oral tradition through the centuries. And... Uh, it was passed down from our ancestors who knew, perfect, who knew perfectly well what they were saying. Uh, and then after the Reformation, even many churches lost connection with the ways that words and phrases and ceremonies from the ancient forms of our faith had uh, been using them through the centuries. Now there's two occasions at least when Southern evangelical Christians connect with these ancient Christian words and ceremonies. One of those is the traditional wedding ceremony. As in when we say, well, she finally drug him to the altar, even though there may be no altar to drag him to. The reason is, uh, for this is that through the centuries, brides have usually insisted that we maintain uh, the ceremony as it was a long time ago. So in weddings, we use candles and we dress up in historical clothes and we even use uh, old language. For example, until very recently, we would say, with this ring, I thee wed. Uh, when I was a child, they added the phrase to that, and with my and all my earthly goods to thee I bestow. But in an age of prenups, that had to be dropped. And now we use that phrase when we are filing for a divorce. <laughs> all my earthly goods to thee I bestow. I can get it later. It's not that funny, actually. <laughs> uh, I felt some pain in the audience. Then at Christmas, we also, we also use, uh, we, we tend to turn to older forms of song and customs that we don't use at other times of the year. At Christmas, we sing old carols or bits and pieces of carols anyway, and we light candles and all of those things that uh, traditionally evangelical Protestants don't do in other parts of the year. But at those times, we reconnect to the more traditional parts uh, and, and elements of our ancient faith. Most of the time, though, those habits, uh, the habits and phrases that kind of get incorporated like this phrase, Lord have mercy, they persist long after the original intent and content that they once communicated uh, has gone away. And the, the phrase, Lord have mercy, is an example of that. But in traditional forms of Christianity, you will hear this phrase used repeatedly throughout the worship service. And the reason for that is that it's often used in, in Scripture. It's repeated often in Scripture. But in the Bible, the word mercy means much more than it means in modern English. 
When we say in modern English, please have mercy, and we're being serious about it, then what we're probably talking to someone who wants to harm us, or we think wants to harm us. We're recognizing that the person has the power, perhaps even the right, to injure us. But we are pleading with them to feel compassion for us instead and to change their minds about what we think they intend to do to, that, to us. And in this case, please have mercy means something like, please don't kill me. But in the Bible, the word mercy describes something like an invisible liquid, a spiritual stream, something that flows out of God's own being into us and into our environment. And so as we are asking God to extend his mercy toward us, we are asking God to cover us with his power and favor and protection. Praying, Lord, have mercy, then, is a plea uh, that divine presence and favor and authority will come upon us and transform us. Some of those meanings persist in other Western languages. In French, for example, when someone has done something good for us, we say merci, which means something like the payment is complete, or you have brought something beneficial into my life that I wish to acknowledge. In Spanish, we use a variation of the word in, in a formal greeting, very formal greeting, vuestra merced, and it literally means your grace. It means something like, I honor your station and your authority. I acknowledge your position as something wholesome and good in my life. If King Juan Carlos or Queen Sofia uh, ever invite me to dinner, I've been waiting a long time on that invitation. When I enter their presence, I will say, some, I will say Vuestra Merced, your grace. And then I will say, what's, what's up? Uh, well, I think I've gone about as far with this as I can. I'll just add the word Mercedes uh, is a girl's name, by the way, and is a title often used to speak of the Virgin Mary. It means Lady of Mercies. A, centuries ago, a century ago, a automobile maker uh, named his best model after one of his daughters, which means some of you are driving a car named after the Virgin Mary, and I pray it's as uh, graceful as its name. So I've tried to explain this morning so far the biblical definition of the word mercy. But what is the motivation behind this ancient Jewish and Christian prayer, Lord have mercy, and why is it so important in Christian liturgies uh, throughout the centuries, and what difference could that possibly make in our lives today? Well, first, the word mercy is really important for you to understand the Bible. In today's psalm, for example, Psalm 130, the concept of mercy hovers over every line. For the psalm begins with someone praying who is in the very depths of despair. The Latin Bible calls this Psalm 130 the De Profundis. From the first uh, verse of the passage, De Profundis clamave a te Domine. And we don't even have to translate that in order to hear the passion that it expresses because it is obviously the prayer of a person who is experiencing profound difficulty. But what kind of difficulty? Well, both Jewish and Christian commentators say the psalmist is expressing despair about his own sin. He can't see a way to extract himself from the dysfunction and wretchedness that afflicts his soul. And so he's crying for help. From the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord, please hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my supplication. And the psalmist also reminds God that his is not a unique case, that he speaks for all humanity. And so he says, if God doesn't help us, we're all doomed. If you would mark iniquity, O Lord, who would stand? But there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared or that you, that you may be held in awe. But then the prayer shifts revealing that the psalmist is not in as much distress as we had thought at first. Even though he is in this de profundis, in the deep, dark pit of sin, he knows full well that God is at work. And he tells us he is waiting on the Lord. He, had, he has placed his hope in, the, in God's word. He waits for God's redemptive work to manifest its full effects, both his life uh, and the life of all of those who trust in the Lord, he says, are safe because God will not fail to deliver us from all our iniquities. 
And so this psalm introduces us to an often neglected aspect of prayer, which is the purposeful cultivation of an attitude of hopeful, expectant, and patient waiting. I say purposefully cultivated because a person doesn't develop an attitude like this without intending to do so. That's why the Bible continually tells us to be sober-minded, mature, thoughtful, and wise. In fact, the most important prayer in Judaism is called the Shema Israel because it, be it begins with the word Shema, which means hear. Hear you, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. I used to find it confusing that a prayer would begin with the word listen. I wondered who, who were we asking to listen to us. It didn't seem right to ask God uh, to pay attention to us, even though uh, that occurs several times in the psalm, including the one we were praying this morning. So we, we do ask God to pay uh, heed to us, to hearken to our voice and so forth. But in the Shema Israel, the one we are paying, uh, asking to pay attention is our very own self. That means that sometimes prayer is meant to talk to us as we pray it, using our own mouth to instruct our own soul to be still, to pay attention to God. And there's many prayers like this in the Bible, especially in the Psalms. Take one of my favorites, Psalm 131. It says, surely I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. The writer of that psalm had learned how to cultivate a, a spirit of prayerful waiting. He had learned how to calm his own self. He had intentionally taught his own soul to take delight in reflective serenity so that he would be able to remind himself that God was at work even now in this pit to utterly redeem and transform him. But how does a person embrace a path like this, especially in a culture like ours that so often labor, labels calm and peace as boring? Even preachers in our culture have learned that if you don't set yourself on fire or levitate or bring a live, a live giraffe into the church, People in the audience are soon going to start surfing the net on their phones. And politicians know this too, which is why it's very unlikely we're going to hear a single speech in this presidential campaign that spells out any coherent policy or any reasonable presentation from any candidate. Because contemporary politicians know what most preachers know now, which is the name of the game is entertainment, the zanier the better. So where, pray tell, in all of this insanity we're in the middle of right now, will one learn to calm his soul or to wait patiently upon the Lord? Somehow we've got to take a turn toward a spiritual path that involves deliberate quiet, reflection, study, and patient waiting. We need to realize this is not a path likely to impress very many contemporary people. We need to understand that the reason we walk this path is because it transforms people. We've got to learn to wait upon the Lord, whatever other people do. Job says in his despair, all the appointed days of my life, I will wait until my change comes. All the appointed days of my life, I will wait. Now, why would anyone calm themselves or patiently expect for God's work to transform them even as the days go by and they're still in the pit? Well, it's because of mercy. Those of us who have confessed Christ have placed ourselves under that same cloud of glory that covered Jesus and Moses on the mountain and made their faces shine like the noonday sun. We are being radiated this morning with mercy. And as we stand under this cloud, if we will stay under the cloud, we are going to mutate. Something is flowing out from God into us that is utterly transforming us. I'm not what I am yet. I'm the embryonic form of eternity. But when eternity comes and the trump of God sounds and the dead in Christ shall rise, I'm going to see Christ as he is. And every person that has this hope, pure 
purifies himself even as he is pure. This is about change. That's why the psalmist concludes his prayer by saying, O Israel, hope thou in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Psalmist is saying not only is help on the way, help is already here. You're already under the spout where the glory comes out. And it's not just for me or for you, but it's for you and your children and their children and as many as the Lord our God shall call. Mercy is already at work on the earth, but we must locate it and ask for it. We must desire it more than life. It has to be the pearl of great price. And this is why I'm going to tell you, if your spiritual life is just something you're sticking on the side of your life, you will never be transformed because church is full of people that never change. But if you're really one under the spout of mercy, you have to constantly ask God, change my thoughts, change my heart, change my action. Let your mercy, oh God, be upon me, transform me, utterly root and branch. It has to be an intense desire an intense desire. Only uh, uh, God asks us only that we cooperate with this mer- work of mercy that He is doing in us. And for God to do His work of mercy in us, He only asks us one thing. He asks that we become a conduit of that same mercy that has flowed into us by extending mercy unto others. That's why Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. We say, well, Lord, I would like to do that, but I would rather keep my distance from sinful people. I just want to bask in your presence here where it's safe. But Jesus says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Now go out there and learn what this means, he says. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call righteous, but sinners to repentance. But Lord, we say we're, we're here today being faithful to your word. We're keeping your commandments. We're witnessing to this wicked culture around us. But we can't hear Jesus shouting back, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. The weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. The weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. And these things, he said, you should have done without leaving the other things undone. Lord, but Lord, you know, you don't know how sick this society is. We're trying to keep that sickness out of your house. And Jesus replies, don't say there's four months and then comes the harvest. I say to you to lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white and ready to harvest. Go out there and extend mercy. So while Nashville's 9,000 churches compete for their share of a shrinking number of people trying to protect that dying culture we call the old time religion. Our city keeps filling up every day with people who are lost and in need of a savior. And not one of those people moving into our city will ever be one to Christ through our anger, our fear, our anxiety, or our resentment. The thing that will reach this new Nashville is mercy, serving people who are hurting in the name of Christ as Christ has served us. Many years ago, one of the members of our church said she wanted to care for young women who were in this very situation described in... Uh, the 130th Psalm. She wanted to help women who felt as though they were in a pit from which they could not escape. That woman, without any money, made a pledge from the beginning of her ministry to tithe any income she would receive to others whom she saw doing God's work. She believed that if tithing was good for individuals, it probably was good for churches and ministries too. Now there's a concept. As if her work were not already challenging enough, she made it more challenging by becoming utterly dependent upon God. And you know why she did this? She did it because she was waiting on the Lord, trusting in Him, 
to do for these young ladies what only God can do, lift them out of the pit and restore their lives. Is it any wonder that she called her work Mercy Ministry? Yes. Mercy Ministries. And listen, it hasn't been the training or goodness or intelligence of the wonderful volunteers that has made the difference in the thousands of women's lives that have been helped since this ministry began. It was not even Nancy Alcorn's personal drive and faith, as important as these have been. What has lifted countless women out of the pit of despair in these years of ministry has been a current of mercy that flows from a place beyond time and space and into our world that heals everyone who plunges in. What does it imply that God placed mercy ministries at this location? And should it surprise us that God placed this very church here as well years before he began sending people from every nation around the world to us? And dear friends, this has been a work of the Spirit. It's been a work of the Spirit. People are from this city right now from all over the world because the sovereign God has called them here. Just like he called the Ethiopian eunuch to Jerusalem. He called them here for a reason. Why, did, why could it be that God sent these people here? It's because he heard the calls of people from the depths of despair and he stepped in to bring them close to where people that know the gospel would serve them with the love of Jesus. In the end, God doesn't care very much about our standard of living. We do. God doesn't. God doesn't care a lot about a lot of things that we're awfully concerned about. What God's concerned is making us fit for heaven and helping us witness to those who need Jesus with the saving grace of Jesus Christ. If God has saved us from our sin and has been at work to transform us as we wait in hopeful expectation, wouldn't it make sense that God now expects us to open up our gates to invite everyone around us to come close so they may experience the same mercy we have experienced? Blessed are the merciful, Jesus says. They shall obtain mercy. And dear brothers and sisters, can we really expect to save people's eternal souls by turning our churches into circuses or stroking people's fears and anxieties about the changing world around us? How foolish. What turns people's hearts toward Christ today is what has always turned, God's, turned people toward Christ. Examples of changed lives. People call out to God for help when they see for themselves what mercy can do. When those in darkness see someone who was once in a pit but has now experienced new life in Christ, they want that same mercy for themselves and their families. These are the people who will pray Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Apostle Paul told us centuries ago how to save souls. Here it is. If you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. <laughs> Let everything you say be good and helpful so your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Everything you say be good and helpful. Ask yourself, is everything I'm saying right now good and helpful? Do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he's identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all your bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander, as well as all other types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you're his dear, dear children. Live a life filled with love. 
Following the example of Christ, he loved us, and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Let there be no sexual immorality, impurity, or greed among you. Wow. It, it's a, such sins have no place among God's people. Stop doing that nasty stuff. Obscene stories, foolish talk, coarse jokes. These are not for you. Oh, ouch. Instead, let there be thankfulness to God. You can be sure that no immoral, impure, or greedy person will ever inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God. God. Say, oh, that's Old Testament stuff. Well, that's pretty New Testament. That's Apostle Paul. I think he's in the New Testament. A greedy person is an idolater. They are worshiping the things of this world. Don't be fooled by those that try to excuse these kinds of sins, for the anger of God will fall on everyone who disobeys them. Don't participate in the things these people do. For once you were full of darkness, but now you have light from the Lord. So live as people of light. For this light within you produces only what is good and right and true. And now Paul says... Carefully determine what pleases the Lord and do that. So it's easy before we do anything or say anything or answer anybody on Facebook. We just say, Lord, what would please you right now in the way I'm responding? And then just do it. Isn't that easy? Lord, what would, would you, do you want me to pass on this rumor or would you rather me just go somewhere and ask your help uh, what would please you in this moment how can I please you well clearly Paul believes that God is at work to transform us he doesn't endorse this contemporary idea that many of us have that we're like everybody else except that we believe in Jesus how cruel it would have been of the Lord to leave us in that pit where we were when we called out to him for help. Why would God tell us that someday in the sweet by and by we will all be changed, but until then, even though we are walking with God and he is living in us, we can fully expect to think, act, and experience life just like those who don't know God. Does that make any sense? No. And if a thousand preachers say that we're, supposed to, we're not supposed to be transformed till we get to eternity, what they're saying is not the truth. Jesus said that something supernatural is occurring in us right now. That God is transforming us now. He's moving in us now. He's touching people through us now. That's why we don't need to be afraid of the changing society around us. We don't need to be resentful and unkind to people who don't know the Lord. What we need to do is experience mercy and show mercy to others and rejoice in God for the pit from which we were dug and ask God to help us to help people to get out of the pit they're in. Right. What Nancy Alcorn discovered years ago and what every preacher in this city, including me, needs to discover is that people in a pit don't need anyone yelling at them. People in a pit don't need others to be disgusted by their problems. Nancy discovered that God doesn't intend his people to run away with those who struggle or to be afraid or to think that somehow their sin is worse than ours. No, God wants us to remember that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. He wants us to experience mercy and he wants us to show mercy. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Nancy knew that Jesus treats sin as an illness of soul and that he is the great physician. She knew that the church is a clinic where the great physician meets people down in the pit that's calling to him for help. Nancy knew that God doesn't want us to make it, make it difficult for those needing grace to enter the life of a God-ordained community where grace is supposed to abound and indeed where mercy gets multiplied. Well, I'm wrapping this up. Two minutes. To make this more specific, 
It is at the table of the Lord where mercy flows from the unseen world into the visible world. That's why the table is located at the very center of the clinic where supernatural transforming power touches those in despair. The, pow the power of the table mystified people in the times of Jesus as much as it is today. But listen to what the Lord said to his disciples about his table. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate man in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven, and anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Well, yuck. Then the people began arguing with each other about what he meant, and they're still doing that. How can this man give us his flesh to eat, they asked. So Jesus said it again. I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life. But anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise that person up at the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink, and anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in, him, in me and I in him. I live because of the living Father who sent me, and in the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, though they ate the manna, but they will live forever. Amen. What this means is that the entire Christian church is called to be a ministry of mercy. Indeed, we really have nothing else to offer. Law doesn't transform people. Clever words can't change people. Great music doesn't change people. The only real purpose we have here as a church is to help people plunge into the stream of mercy that flows from heaven and through the community of God's people. And it is this purpose that has moved Christians in every generation since Christ to pray what that song was saying, Christi eleison, uh, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy upon us. Would you stand? I want to stand at the table. We're not having communion today. But I want to stand at the Lord's table. Mercy's flowing. And in these seconds here before we leave, I want you to know that whatever your sin may be, whatever your thoughts may be, whether you've not been able to pay attention to me because your thoughts are so scattered or you're so anxious, doesn't matter. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And one moment just takes a second. All you have to do is to say, have mercy, Lord, on me. Jesus told the story and said, who is, who is the person that's justified? He said, a, a real law-keeping upright person in the temple came and began to pray beautiful prayers. And they said, oh God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I pay my tithes. And all the priests says, thank you, Lord, for this good saint of God. So faithful. I pay my tithes. I pray several times a day. I know the scripture. Not like all these other people out here, oh God. That's because you've done something different in me than you've done in them. I'm so glad. And Jesus said there was another man come in and he was agreeing with the guy. No, I'm not like him. Oh God, he says, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. And you know what? When he said the word mercy, have mercy on me, something in heaven gets triggered when people says have mercy on me. The spigot gets turned on. Hallelujah. God said somebody down there is calling out for help. 
Somebody down in the pit of their despair, they don't know where their next meal's coming from. They don't know how they're going to get out of this illness right now. They've got, they've got ghosts in their mind. They can't get out of their head. They don't know where help is coming from, but they're calling for mercy. Now, I want you to put all the resources of heaven to their disposal and lift them up out of the pit. That's what mercy is about. And if a church wants to be favored of God, it has to be a place of mercy and grace and power and a desire and a hungry hunger to know the living God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, we got to sing or I'll keep on going. So we're going to sing, right? God be with you till we meet again. That's a dismissal song. So it's as we're doing this, as we're singing this, I want you to be mindful of the different people, yourself, maybe, maybe you're in pretty good shape right now. You, you feel pretty good. But there's people all in this place today and even people listening online who are in great despair and they don't know what to do. As, and maybe they've been uplifted by the service, but now they're going back into the daily grind and they just, oh, I don't know, I just wish the service would never end. Unlike some of us that hopes it won't be never ending. <laughs> and they're just hanging on this last moment. I want us to bless them by singing this beautiful song that God will be with them wherever they go as we leave this place. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels. By his counsels, God. Grace and peace be with you. Go and serve the Lord.